Dale got me on the previous song. I thought it was my time. So I started coming up here. And then Dale started singing another song. I guess what I'm ashamed to say most of all is that's not the first time I've done that. Just stand up in a service thinking we were done. One time when I was in high school, I was sitting in the front. Mr. Bryan said, go ahead and get out your song books as he was preaching and he was delivering his invitation. But as soon as he said song books, I just jumped up with my song book. Like we were about to sing the invitation song. <sighs> then I realized no one else was standing up. What I'd like to talk to you about uh, tonight for the time that I have is actually just to talk about Barnabas. Uh, if you remember last Sunday morning, I used Acts 11 as one of my main themes and my key passages. Uh, and there's something in Acts 11 that I think is very telling about Barnabas and something I felt like I hadn't really been able to explore before. And that's just the concept that there was a moment that Saul was so discouraged and had to leave Jerusalem in such a bad way where even Jesus got involved and felt like he had to talk to Saul about it. And we just see in the Acts account that Saul goes to Tarsus, and we don't know what he's doing in Tarsus, but it seems like it's not a good situation where he's just discouraged. And maybe Saul's teaching there, but we don't get told that. But as Barnabas goes up to Antioch, he remembers somehow, hey, wait, Saul is over here in Tarsus. And all Luke says is, is that Barnabas went to Tarsus, he sought out Saul, and he brought him back to Antioch. And that's where we see Saul begin to do the teaching and the ministry that he did there in Antioch after Barnabas went and brought him there. We know that Barnabas is the son of encouragement. Uh, and probably uh, any time you've ever heard a sermon on encouragement, it had something to do with Barnabas. The word encouragement is used six times in Acts. And two of them are referring to Barnabas in his namesake. We would already know going into this that Christians are fueled by encouragement. We, we don't run on discouragement, we run on encouragement. And discouragement is almost as if someone's trying to empty our fuel tanks, right? And we get burned out, but when we are encouraged, instead it's like someone's putting fuel in our tanks and we run on encouragement. Things are better when we're encouraged, things are worse when we're discouraged. Just to get us in the mindset of what we're gonna talk about, and if you turn to Acts 11, you can put your marker there. But let me just show you three passages that kind of get on the attitude of what I'm trying to describe. I believe this clicker is dead. Forward. There we go. Romans 15. Romans 15, starting just in one, just one through four, not 44, says, When we are strong, ought to bear the scrumples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The word encouragement isn't in this passage, but the thought is in this passage. Do you see what the thought is here? Number one, those who are strong ought to uphold the weak and bear with the weak in the ways that they can bear the weak. That our mission as strong is not to please ourselves, but to please others so that we might encourage others. Our mission is anything that's leading to edification. And that's the building up of God's people, correct? Now, ultimately, and the reason why I wanted to use this passage, where does true comfort and encouragement come from? Does it come from us? No, he tells us where true comfort comes from. It comes from the scriptures and the hope that we find in the scriptures, where, frankly, the most encouraging thing in this building isn't a person. It's these books we have in our hands. That's where true encouragement comes from. Now, even though that's the case, does it always work perfectly that way? Is every brother or sister we've ever met have the maturity level to know that? that all they need is right there in the scriptures. In reality, that's just not the case. There's a human element needed to pass on encouragement. And let me show you my second passage, 1 Thessalonians 5. 
Look how Paul here ends his book. He talks about the day of the Lord. He talks about that the people that were already dead will be raised in the day of the Lord. 1 Timothy 5, he ends it with this. Therefore, because of all that, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. A second passage where the word encouragement isn't used, but it's all in there. He says here, comfort one another, edify one another. That's similar language we saw last time. They're already doing that. And you notice between a difference between this section and this section, These are people above you, right? Those who are over you in the Lord. I think specifically he's talking about an eldership. What are we supposed to do to that group of people? We're supposed to admonish them. We're supposed to encourage them. We're supposed to edify them, right? Esteem them very highly. Now, what's this group? Well, this is the weak. These are the people that probably are spiritually on a level under you. What are you supposed to do for them? The same exact thing. You're supposed to uphold them. You're supposed to encourage them. You're supposed to comfort them, right? The encouragement here for me, which direction should it be going? Encouragement should be coming from me in all directions. And I'm supposed to uphold the weak, and I'm supposed to esteem highly those over me. We as brothers and sisters in Christ, we get encouragement from the word. But we ourselves are meant to be sources of encouragement where we would pass that on to other people, thereby fueling the church. The church is fueled by encouragement, whether it's coming from the word or coming from the word through people to us. Now, go back two chapters to chapter three. This is my last passage. You see it very used very specifically on about one person, Timothy. If you remember in the Thessalonica story, Paul has to leave Thessalonica really quickly. He wants to stay, but they try to murder him. You know, it's a typical thing for Paul, right? And he has to leave really quickly. And as he gets to Athens, he starts worried about Thessalonica. So he says, when our hearts couldn't handle it anymore, we sent Timothy back to check on you. And this is what he says in 1 Thessalonians 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning the faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Because of his worry about the struggles and the persecution going on in Thessalonica, what does Paul do? He sends Timothy to establish and encourage concerning your faith. And that's what Timothy does, right? Can you see how the word establish and the word encourage go hand in hand. If I encourage a brother in his faith, what am I also doing? I'm establishing that brother in his faith. If a man is encouraged to stand in his faith, is he ever going to leave that faith? Not as long as he's encouraged and he feels so to do so. That therefore, by also, he's established in that faith. And I think that's the hallmark and the goal here for encouragement is that I can establish my brothers and sisters in their faith by encouraging them to stand forth in the faith. Now that I think that we've all got kind of got this mindset of what I'm talking about, now let's talk about Barnabas. Acts is where we see he brings Paul to Antioch. And this isn't the only time he brings Paul to Antioch. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, we see the first thing that Barnabas does for Saul. In Acts chapter 9, Barnabas first meets Saul, whom we know as Paul, by taking a risk to meet him in the first place. In Acts chapter 9, Saul has been converted on the way to Damascus. Ananias tells him what he must do, as Jesus said, to go find what you must do. He says, arise and be baptized, wash away your sins. He spends some time in Damascus. We know he spends some time in Arabia. But at some point, he makes it to Jerusalem for the very first time. And that's what picks up in this reading. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, 
He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Saul gets to Jerusalem for the first time and he tries to join the Christians there. They don't accept him. Why? Because they were afraid of him. Why would they be afraid of him? Because the last time Saul was in town, he was killing Christians. That's why they're afraid of him. And when all of a sudden Saul shows back up and he says, hey, I'd like to identify with your group, are they going to be like, oh, good. You know, let's get Gene to go take your picture. You know, that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, uh, I don't know who you are, nor do I believe that you're actually very sincere. They think he's trying to figure out how to get more of them in prison. So what does Barnabas do? Barnabas takes a risk and he meets Saul. Verse 27 says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that how he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. Barnabas took a risk and risked it all to meet Saul sat down with Saul, asked Saul what his story was, asked Saul to prove these things to be true. Now that Saul's been given the opportunity, he convinces Barnabas that he's truthful and sincere, and then Barnabas takes the initiative to endorse Saul to the apostles. What has Saul been given here? Saul has been given a chance. Saul has been given an opportunity. Would Saul have had that opportunity without Barnabas? I mean, you could argue someone else would come along and done the same thing. But here, would he have had that opportunity? I don't think he would have. It was because of Barnabas' risk. It's because of Barnabas taking the initiative that Saul's able to join the group at Jerusalem. If we kept on reading, we see that he begins to teach and preach in Jerusalem. They're having a good old time. But then the Hellenists find out and they try to murder Saul. So Saul has to flee. Acts 22 gives us more of the story. Jesus has to come to Saul in the temple because Saul's praying, saying, they won't accept me. I'm having no use here. I'm useless here. And Jesus has to tell Saul, well, then I'll send you to the Gentiles. And around that time is when Saul left Jerusalem and he went to Tarsus. So we see that Saul leaves and now we're back in Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem comes to find out after the death of Stephen that there's a church now in Antioch and that this church has Gentiles and Jews meeting there together. When they hear about this, they need to send somebody up to Antioch to encourage the brethren there. Lo and behold, who do they pick to send? They choose Barnabas to send up to this new church to encourage the brethren. If we look now in chapter 11, 1125. Well, I want to start before that. Let's go back to 22. Finding out about the church at Antioch, verse 22 says, The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. (laughs) Why does Barnabas encourage them to continue with the Lord? Because that's what Barnabas does. I mean, the apostles changed his name to son of encouragement. That's what he does. He encourages you with purpose of heart to continue with the Lord. He encourages you to establish in your faith. Verse 24, it describes Barnabas, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and the faith, and of great many people were added to the Lord. But verse 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And Barnabas and Saul stay there in Antioch until much later in 13 when the Holy Spirit calls them to go on their first missionary journey. Barnabas leaves Antioch to seek Saul. Can you think about this for uh, just a second? You were sent by the church of Jerusalem to check out this new church, the church at Antioch. And there's an expectation that you're going to teach them, you're going to encourage them, you're going to establish them in the Lord. Do you think it was a big deal for Barnabas to make the decision to leave Antioch and go to Tarsus? Can I suppose you that it was? 
that it would have been a big deal. It's not like this is his vacation. It's not like he can call up the church at Jerusalem and say, hey, is it okay if you let me go? I, this is a big deal. This is another big risk to say, you know what? I know Saul somewhere there in Tarsus. If I hop over there real quick, maybe I can find him. Why would Barnabas be inclined to do such a thing? Would it not be because he knows that Saul has an ability? That Saul has an ability to teach the gospel? And he knows that if he can get Saul in there, he will be a help? to him teaching the gospel. And so Barnabas takes the risk and he leaves Antioch to seek Saul. When he finds Saul, it says that Barnabas brought Saul to teach at Antioch. That Barnabas is behind all of this now for the second time. That every time Saul's in a discouraged place or a place that he's left out, Barnabas is the one who goes and gets Saul and says, here you go, here's your opportunity. I need you to teach here. And the rest of the passage says the same thing. And Saul began to teach the people there. Because this is what Barnabas did, and this was his relationship with Saul. My conclusion to all this is Barnabas encouraged Saul to use his abilities to serve in the kingdom. That's what Barnabas did. And I understand that Saul's an apostle. I understand that Saul's already been gifted power. I understand that Saul already has the Holy Spirit's help in doing these things. However, the way that Luke and Saul paint this story is that Saul is not doing much until he meets Barnabas in both times. That Barnabas was the key factor. He was the turning point that got Saul to begin to use his abilities for the kingdom. And that's why he's the son of encouragement. That's why we're talking about him. Barnabas calls many of the turning points in Paul's life. And here are the two big ones. And Barnabas was the one behind. Many of us have turning points in our lives. And hopefully just by saying that phrase, you know what I'm talking about. We all have come to crossroads in our lives, if we reflect, where we had to make decisions. Where we were going to live, what we were going to do, who are we going to marry. All those very important questions we have to ask ourselves. And we remember going back to there, we had options. Am I going to go to the right or am I going to the left? And at those crossroads, we often talk about the crossroad itself. But if you go back into your mind when you had to make those decisions, were there not influential people there at the crossroads that were telling you, hey, you should go right? Hey, you should go left? Did you not have people like that? Because I did. I had Barnabases in my life that said, hey, you can go that way, but if you want to, I'll take you to Antioch. That, hey, I can see that you can do this. I think you could be good at this. Hey, would you come to Antioch with me? You should be going in this direction. And those were the encouragers. Those were the influential people in my life that brought me to Antioch. I am not in any way a self-made man. You'll hear people talk about self-made men, or people say self-made millionaires or something like that, right? And what they do is they talk about a man or a woman that has a lot of accomplishments and they say, hey, they did it all on their own. They pulled themselves up from their bootstraps and they got to work and they accomplished all these great things. I am not a self-made man. Every success I have had in my life has only been because someone gave me the opportunity to do it and someone taught me how to do it. There's nothing self-made about me. What I really am is instead a very grateful man, hopefully. That I'm grateful that there were men and women in my life that took the initiative, they took the risk, and they gave me opportunities to use my abilities for the kingdom. That's who I am. I'm not self-made. One of those men was named Brad Cicero. And many of you don't know who he is unless you have some kind of connection to Tuscaloosa. Many of you instead know Jason Cicero, his son, who's had several meetings here at Gardendale. He's done a great job. When I came to Tuscaloosa years ago, 2011, y'all, I was a nobody. I had no really ambitious plans. I was just there to go to school and get out. But if I was going to go to school in Tuscaloosa, I was going to have to go to Northwood. 
That's the group that I knew about. And when I went to Tuscaloosa, and when I came in there and I used to sit in the back, I had a Barnabas adopt me there. And a Barnabas is too, his wife, Miss Mary. And Mr. Brad and Miss Mary adopted me at 20 years old and helped me make those big decisions in my life that led me where? To Antioch. When I got there, I wasn't preaching. I wasn't teaching. I was the kid in the back in Bible class that made jokes. That was my greatest ambition in Bible class in those times. And thinking about Mr. Brad and thinking about Miss Mary and thinking about the things that they did to bring me to Antioch, I I tried to piece together things that Brad did for me at Northwood before I moved here to Gardendale that really got me going in a good direction. And I I made a list on my board in my office, and I, I put that list up here on the screen. The first thing that Mr. Brad did for me was he sought me out. And he would always take time to speak to me. Meaning that I didn't go looking for him. He went looking for me. He picked me out and he would always try to come and speak to me. And we would talk about anything, you know. It's not necessarily we had to talk about something important every time. He just wanted to communicate to me. He wanted me to know who he was and he wanted to know who I was. And it all started at the church building after church. I'd just hang around long enough, and he would eventually come up to me, and we would talk to each other about something. And through all those conversations, eventually, me and Mr. Brad really developed a good friendship. Eventually, he starts asking me to help him. And I'm 21 years old. I'm 20 years old. There's not a lot I can help with, but I can go with him to do some kingdom work. He was an elder at the congregation there. There were times he had to visit someone that was sick. And that was something that was very appropriate for me to go with him with. And so he would say sometimes, he'd say, hey, Andrew, on Tuesday, I'm going to go visit sister so-and-so. I would like for you to come with me. And what was I going to tell him? No. Of course, I wasn't going to tell him no. He was going to take me out to lunch and I was hungry. (laughs) So I would go with him. And we would go visit sister so-and-so. And we would read the Bible to sister so-and-so, and and we would visit sister so-and-so, and and then he would take me to the front porch, and he would buy me lunch. And so there was an opportunity that he would come and he would help me, or really help him help me do kingdom work. Another thing I wrote down thinking about him was that he encouraged me to teach. You know, I I had not taught anything, and I had taught boys' classes back at Prattmont, but I hadn't taught a Bible class or anything. When Justin Roberson was teaching all of our on-campus studies, it was usually on Thursday night, we would go on campus at UA and we would teach something in a room we rented out. A lot of the college kids came, they could bring their friends, it was that sort of thing. He encouraged me to teach one of those classes. And he talked to me, what would you talk about? And I was like, well, I really like this hymn and I would want to teach something about this hymn. And he's like, all right, well, you should go teach something about that hymn. And he's like, maybe you should actually read some Bible, though, and here's some Bible passages you could go over. And I got all ready to go teach my first campus class. And Mr. Brad came. Y'all know what it's like to be 21 years old, sitting on campus, usually on the floor or on the grass, you know, something that we do anyway. And, And you look around to the people you're teaching, and you've got a 20-year-old here, and you've got a 21-year-old here, and you've got a 22-year-old here, and you've got a 68-year-old here, and you've got a 21-year... Wait, hold on. Mr. Brad would come. And he's in his upper 60s, but he would come, and he'd come, and he'd come to our campus class to encourage me and to support me with the studies I was doing. He tried eventually to meet up with me at least once a week. And at the time, you know, I thought it was very just, uh, you know, happen chance that he would go, hey, you want to meet up this week, you want to meet this week? But now that I've gotten a little older, I realize I do the same thing to some people. Where I say, hey, you want to meet me Tuesday? Hey, you want to meet me Thursday? And he always found opportunities so he could meet with me and we could get together and talk. Sometimes, a lot of times that was for Bible study. A lot of times that was just to get together and spend some time together. We talk about God. We talk about school. We talk about girls. That's what we talk about. 
And we developed a friendship, a close friendship, because he spent that amount of time weekly with me. What else are you going to get but a friendship out of that? When I was like 20, I guess, 21 is when I first started spending time with him. He invited me to come over to him and Miss Mary's house. And Justin and Lauren and another couple were going to be there. And he said, hey, we're going to come. We're going to play a game. You need to bring a date. Now, I had been talking big game to him last week about how many options I had. So he pushed to me. He said, okay, Andrew, you've got 24 hours. You better find a date. I asked four girls. They all said no. So I showed up to Mr. Brad's house with no date. I went to go see him like two years ago, 27 years old, married. And he sits me down and he goes, hey, do you remember that time I told you to bring a date and you couldn't find anybody to come with you? I'm like, yeah, you tend to remind me. We had a friendship. And that friendship was there because he spent time with me. And that's the only way friendships develop. Another thing that I wrote down is that he gently corrected me. When I used to preach, I used to tell a lot of stories. A lot of them were funny. And sometimes it was just a stand-up routine. And he corrected me about that. And I remember those conversations where he said, those was one too many stories, Andrew. That was too much funny time up there, Andrew. And he would take the initiative to tell me those things so I could make the corrections. He also praised me, though. And the more I began teaching and the more I began preaching and the more things that those abilities I started seeing there while I was in Tesco's and I've been able to give opportunities to use those abilities, if I did a good job on something, he would also take the time to tell me that I did a good job. You, you should keep on doing those things. That was kind of a direction you would want to go in. He took me to Antioch. And let me say this one as well. He protected me. Every congregation, you know, whether you like it or not, has brothers and sisters that often are discouraging. And either they're discouraged people and they, you know, have discouragement out in their wake, or frankly, you have a lot of brothers and sisters that really mean well, but they're just discouraging people. They don't know how to communicate. And they might be trying to tell you encouraging things, but frankly, it just comes out of discouraging and mean because they don't know how to communicate to another person. When you're 23 years old and you're preaching for your first time, those discouraging comments hurt. You know, now people say mean things to me in the foyer and Rusty has to pull me off of them. But when I was 22 years old, guys, I just ate those things and I went home and it ate me alive. What did Brad do? Brad would stay in the foyer, and he stopped people, and he watched people. And if someone got a comment across to me, he would go and he would correct them in front of me. He protected me from discouragement. Why? Because he was trying to bring me along to Antioch, and he didn't want any hurdles to get in our way. That's the thing I think maybe I, I take for granted, the importance of him protecting Another thing that he did is he treated me as valuable to the kingdom, even though I was a nobody. He told me I was important. He told me I was helpful. He told me I was doing something for the kingdom. But at the time, I, <laughs> I was just going with him, you know, a few places. You know, I was teaching a 20-year-old campus class, but he would tell me I'm useful. I'm valuable. Jesus needs that. Everybody wants a Timothy, but only a few want a Saul and a Mark. And what I mean by that is, if you remember in Acts 16 too, Paul meets Timothy on the second missionary journey. And what Luke says about Timothy there is that Timothy was a young man full of good reputation among all. Where Timothy was already in a situation there at Lystra where people knew who he was, people knew what his abilities were, people knew that something great was going to come from Timothy. Did Barnabas ever pick up Timothy? And it's fine to pick up and adopt Timothy. But did Barnabas get him? No, Barnabas got a Saul. Barnabas got someone with a terrible record, a terrible past, someone that nobody expected anything from. He adopted him. 
when John Mark leaves in the first missionary journey, and we don't know why, John Mark just goes home. If you remember at the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas have a fight about it. And, and let me be fair, Paul was right not to want to take to John Mark. John Mark abandoned him. He didn't want to take someone that wasn't ready yet. But what did Barnabas do? He was also in the right. He wanted to give somebody like Mark a second chance. Why? Because that's who Barnabas is. He goes after the Sauls and the Marks in the world. He wants to adopt them, not necessarily the Timothys, but the people that need a lot of help. Do we all benefit from Barnabas taking Mark? Every time we read the Gospel of Mark, we benefit that Barnabas encouraged that man who gave us one of the Gospels of God because Barnabas took the time to encourage somebody. Barnabas, he wants a Saul or a Mark. It was amazing and almost disturbing where I was in a place where my only friend <laughs> over 60 was one man, Brad Cicero. And then... I began preaching, and I began preaching a lot, and then I ended up getting better at it, and then I was going to leave and come to Gardendale, and then all of a sudden, before I came to Gardendale, I had 30 older men that wanted to be my best friend and wanted to give me advice. You see how hypocritical that would come across to a 22-year-old? But, you know, when he was here, he's been a member here for years. And nobody took notice of him, but now that he's in the spotlight a little bit more, everybody wants to, oh, I'm Andrew's mentor. I'm Andrew's mentor. No, Andrew only had one mentor, and that was Brad Cicero. Why? Because Brad loved me when I was a nobody. Brad treated me as valuable when I was a nobody. And that's why I loved him and trusted him. Many of y'all loved me when I was a nobody. Clayton, you loved me when I was a nobody. Many of y'all have done that same thing. And we have to find others to do the same thing for as well, to treat them as valuable even before they've really found out what their abilities are. Let's go back to Barnabas one more time with those four things, and let's make some conclusions and some applications from them. The first one, if you remember, was that Barnabas went and took a risk to meet Saul. Encouragers like Barnabas, they see the ability in others, especially when those abilities are not being used. Not when they are being used, when they're not being used. That's when someone like a Barnabas, an encourager, goes and finds that person and adopts that person. You know, if you're inspired by this sermon in some way, and you go, you know what, I need to be doing that same thing. I need to be going adopting younger brothers and sisters. And I need to be mentoring them and taking them into Antioch. That's wonderful. That, that's what the attitude I want you to have. But don't go after the people that are already using their abilities. You know, if you get this attitude, okay, you know, I, I want to mentor someone. I want to help someone to cultivate their abilities. Don't go, okay, I'm going to go mentor Lee. I'm going to go mentor Nathan. You don't go encourage the encouragers. Now, it's fine, of course, to encourage everybody. It's fine to develop friendships. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the men that are already participating in a public way, those shouldn't be your main targets. That wasn't Barnabas' main targets. What kind of younger men and younger women should you be looking for? You should be looking for the younger men and younger women of this congregation that aren't in the forefront. Look for the ones that you don't know what kind of abilities they have. Those are the ones that need to be encouraged. Those are the ones that need to be pulled to the fore. And I think us as being Barnabases, we're going to be used more greatly in that way. Don't be looking for the, the men and the women that have already found their abilities. Be looking for the men and women that have yet to find their abilities and cultivate those abilities. Help them find those abilities. That's what true Barnabases do. Encouragers as well, they take initiatives to encourage and polish those abilities. Meaning that if I'm going to be the older, you know, if I'm going to be the mentor, and let's face it, older, younger, that's a very relative term, isn't it? You know, you could be 20 years old and there could be younger brothers and sisters than you that look up to you, right? But if you want to adopt someone younger than you 
and you want to be a mentor to them and you want to encourage them, you're going to have to take the initiative. Don't be waiting around in the, the foyer like they're going to come up to you. You know, that you're not going to be like, oh, I want to be a Barnabas. And there's going to be some kid come to you, hey, mister, will you be my Barnabas? Like, that's not going to happen, is it? You're going to have to take the initiative. You're going to have to pick somebody out. You're going to have to go after them. You're going to have to start the conversation. They're not going to. They're not in that position. But you are. We have to take the initiative as the encouragers that we are going to encourage someone, you know, and we're going to encourage them whether they like it or not. You know, that's kind of the attitude that we have to go about with this. You know, as well, encouragers have to leave their comfort zones to seek others. When Barnabas left Antioch to go seek Saul, there's ways that we like to be comfortable. We like to come in. We like to sit in our spot. You know, we like to know the people that we're sitting around, that sort of thing. If we're going to be encouragers, though, we're going to have to leave that comfort zone. And we're going to have to go and be ambitious to go find relationships with people that we may not know all that well. And we're going to have to leave our comfort zones to do that. Mr. Brad, when I met him, already was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And my three years in Tuscaloosa, that Parkinson's disease ate him up. I knew that it would have been easier for him to shut down and retire. I knew that it would have been easier for him not to get out today. But what did he do? Every time we planned to meet or every time the church met, he left his comfort zone. And even with that terrible disease, he still found a way to force himself to make time. And every day, I I think more of him for it. The fourth thing is encouragers put effort into others. Usually, many others. After Barnabas got done with his relationship with Saul, Saul didn't need Barnabas like he once did. What did Barnabas do? Well, it seems that he ran off and he did the same thing to Mark. He just found someone new to adopt, being that he doesn't need, this one person doesn't need him anymore. (laughs) Mr. Brad passed away two weeks ago. And me and Sarah went to his funeral Thursday. I thought I was pretty special. (laughs) That I was Mr. Brad's special adopted son. But lo and behold, I go to that funeral. That man had adopted 50 sons. And there were men there that had gone to Alabama and at Northwood in the 90s. And there were men there present that were going to school there last year, this year. And they had all come to be with people and talk about Mr. Brad. And they all (laughs) felt like they were Mr. Brad's special person. You know what that man was doing after people like me left? He was just going and getting another one. All right, bye, Andrew. He'd go off and he'd go to somebody else. Because when encouragers put effort into others, they usually put effort into many others. Something that uh, me and Jason have been joking about in our judges class, or at least we were, was the donkeys. If you remember some of the judges, when the men die, it says a little something nice about them. And it says, well, Abdon, he judged Israel for so many years. And it says, and Abdon had 40 sons, and they rode 40 donkeys. And we all go, wow. And then you go to Jer, right? And it's like, Jer judged Israel for so many years, and he had 30 sons, and they rode on 30 donkeys. Me and Jason always go, wow. All right, moving on. There was something special said about these men by how many sons they had. It was their power. When I went to Mr. Brad's funeral, I realized he had 50 sons. And they all drove trucks. (laughs) You know what I mean? But what could be said is that he had 50 adopted sons, and they all had abilities that they used for the kingdom of God. 
he did that in 30 years. My entire lifespan. He was only 71 when he passed away. And he had had that many men that he had adopted and encouraged and honed and polished. And he sent them out to the world. Lord willing, if I get to live to 75, just a few more years after that, I hope that I've done my work today. That people can say that Andrew had 50 sons and they all had abilities they used for the kingdom of God. If we all had this attitude, this can be said about his kingdom. And wouldn't the kingdom be so much better off with more encouragers like Barnabas and Mr. Brad in the world? Thank you for your attention. Ultimately, the purpose of encouragement, like we saw back in 1 Thessalonians 3, you know, it wasn't just to have friends, even though that's nice. You know, it wasn't just to have loving friendships, which is great. The purpose was to establish people in the faith. The purpose of encouragement is so that you can be not friends with me, but you can be friends with Jesus. Because that's ultimately where all comfort comes from. If there's any way we can assist you tonight, whether that be through the waters of baptism or whether that's be that you have questions, you want to study, you want to know about this Jesus, we want to assist you with that too if you will come forward as we stand and sing. Careless soul, why will you linger?